Greetings and my salutation to our lovely Dr. Zikin and my fellow friends. Uh, I hope you guys are doing fine and please take care of yourself. Stay home, be safe and don't forget to eat healthy guys. Anyway, my name is Muhammad Anwar bin Idhan Awawi with matrix number 047732 and today my group will be presenting about one of the most important things in doing research which is the collection of textual artifacts. Okay, before I start, I want to ask you one question. What comes onto your mind about artifacts? Yeah, excellent, you're right. Artifacts uh, may be objects made by human beings, typically to represent any form of cultural or historical interest. But what is actually collection of textual artifacts in research methodology? So today, we're going to discuss uh, about the definition and the types of textual artifacts, the purpose of collection of textual artifacts, uh, the procedures in collecting uh, it, the advantages and disadvantages, ethical consideration in collecting textual artifacts, example of past study, and last but not least, the conclusion. The collection of textual artifacts is the action or process of gathering past texts and documents created and used by members in any particular organization or institution to foster understanding as stated by Cohen and Coptry in 2016. So past texts and documents here refer to any form of textual materials created for us to understand better and to attain information. There are numbers of different types of textual artifacts that researchers may be interested in collecting. For example, the first one, documents in public sphere. For instance, we have pictures with text, articles, for instance, article regarding history of English language, obesity, politics, or etc. Um, and then transcriptions of documentaries, educational materials such as books, textbooks, novels, reference books that have been produced and then uh, we have files and statistical records whenever you go to hospitals your data entry will be kept in their registration files and that could be considered as textual artifacts too and then we have minutes of meeting whenever you have meetings the secretary will prepare the minutes of meeting and then we have emails I'm pretty sure you got this a lot and then documents in daily basis, for instance, uh, internal manuals, written procedures, public posting, chart flow, statistic. Uh, talking about statistic, for instance, currently, Kementerian Kesehatan Malaysia (KKM) is updating the statistic of COVID-19 patients. So you can have a look uh, on the statistic at your Instagram page. And last but not least, memos. And these are some of the examples of textual artifacts. Assalamualaikum. Hi everyone. My name is Sarah Shafika binti Daud with metric number 047774. Okay, so for my part, I will be explaining the purpose of collecting textual artifacts. So of course, textual artifacts is a source of information. However, by just the name textual artifacts, it doesn't necessarily need to have data in it. For example, an unfilled form to apply for a loan, to apply for a university, for example, that unfilled form can also be a textual artifact. Textual artifact has many purposes and it can represent a lot of things. Uh, specifically, uh, it depends on where you are trying to find your textual artifacts and what is your research about. So there are five functions of textual artifacts uh, quoted by Bowen in 2009. First of all, to provide data and information. So textual artifacts is a great way to provide reference to past events, especially if your witness or the participant can no longer retain or remember the information or they are no longer there. Uh, for example, uh, a historical insight. If let's say the event has uh, hap uh, happened, the ev sorry, the event happened maybe 100, 200 years ago and there are no longer surviving or living 
uh, human beings that participate in that event. So textual artifacts is a great source to provide insight on particular events and information. Second, to suggest questions and ensure research is critical and unique. Textual artifacts can help in suggesting questions and situations that can be observed. Uh, when analyzing information, a researcher should observe questions that can be asked to be applied and answered in the research. So, for example, uh, Bowen cited Goldstein and Liebold. Uh, they conducted a longitudinal ethnographic study of service used among families living in poor urban communities. They generated new interview questions by analyzing the document. So they basically compared the uh, old study and the new study and see what new questions they can, can, can come up with, what new or different problems that differentiate from the past and the current uh, study, for example. Alright, so the third research is to provide supplementary research data. So if let's say the research you are uh, conducting is not using textual artifacts as your main research design, I think it can still be used to provide good support as a complementary data to strengthen the research or to prove a point. So for example, as cited by Hoelf, I'm not sure if I said that right, but he did uh, he conducted a study of closure of technology teacher education programs. So he used newspaper reports, university policy documents, and department self evaluation data to supplement the data gained from interviews that he conducted. So by the example here, I think you should have a clear view by what I meant in being a supplementary research data. Okay. So let's move on to the fourth point is to track change and development. As I have mentioned in my first point, I said that textual artifact is a great source if the person you are trying to find for interview and whatnot can no longer remember the information or if they have passed away for example and they are and you have no one else to refer to. So, this is another big point. Textual artifact can be a window to the past and a source for the future. You can compare data, analysis, and findings to identify any changes in development or anything from the past research and the research you are currently conducting. So as cited by Bowen, Yin believes that even minor changes can show great developments. This can be applied when conducting longitudinal case, meaning studying the same case at different periods of time. Alright, so maybe you want to conduct a study of comparing the Prime Minister right now and the first Prime Minister of Malaysia, Tun Abdul Razak. But Tun Abdul Razak is of course no longer here. He passed away a long time ago. So you can use textual artifacts. You can f try to find textual artifacts to observe, track changes and development. This can be anything from books about him, from his diaries, shows about him and etc. Alright, so other than that, the researcher may also examine periodic and final reports, if they are available, to get a clear picture of how an organization or a program fared over time. Alright, so the last point is to verify findings and acts as proof. By analyzing textual artifacts, a researcher can verify findings or validate evidence from other sources. Typically, sociologists would use this method. When the evidence or findings maybe contradict a current research, the researcher should investigate further. When information of different sources overlap, it increases the credibility of the findings. So if you want to find uh, support 
in terms of your study in terms of theory or data you can use textual artifacts to verify your research Assalamualaikum and good day to everyone I'm Nurul Dalila Karinisa binti Muhammad Lutfi with the metric number of 047772 So for my part, I will be explaining the ways in planning and collecting your textual artifacts. I have found two strategies that can be used as guidelines since there are no specific rules to follow. So the first guideline is from Campbell's two steps in collecting information via artifacts. The first step is to obtain permissions to access the artifacts. By doing so, you actually protect the people's right and can still get quality answers to your research questions from their artifacts. You will want to ensure that you protect your own legal rights and those of your employer or clients as you will no doubt become private information that is governed by intellectual property law. The main reason why you need to obtain permissions in the first place before even accessing any artifacts is because You want to get a license in order to use the artifacts. If you did not obtain any license or even permissions, then your work that uses the artifacts that you somehow managed to obtain is considered as a copyright infringement, which then could lead to any legal actions. So the le- the second step is to collect the information from the artifacts. If possible, you will be given permission to take exact copies of artifacts with you for later analysis. However, if you are allowed only on-site access to artifacts and you have a fairly focused research questions, you will probably want to use a form for collecting information rather than simply taking notes. As you can see here, you need to find a specific way or form in order to collect your needed information if you are only given an on-site access since you can't actually bring the artifacts or even the copy of the artifacts home for any further inspections so moving on to the next guideline from guides and lee kong that is entitled the four step guidelines for artifacts collection the first step is to locate the artifacts search for your required artifacts either online and offline before trying to obtain the essential permission and assessing the artifacts. For example, your research is about the history of English language. So you can start your search on the textual artifacts that is related to your topic by visiting the local library or even analyzing past researches that can be found online. The second step is identifying the materials. Researchers had to make sure whether the textual artifacts fits with their research aims and questions. For instance, you can examine the materials by skimming and scanning the keywords that can be used for your research. By doing by doing skimming and scanning, you can know whether the artifacts are suitable for your research or that you need to find a new artifact. The third step is analyzing the artifacts. Begin analyzing the textual artifacts by using the document analysis procedure for a much more detailed process. You can see and point out which information can be used for your research and which information is invalid for your research. The differences between this step and step 2 is that in step 2, you just want to know whether the artifacts can be used. And while in this step, this is where you critically analyze the whole textual artifacts in order to find valuable information that is connected to your research. The fourth and f- the fourth and final step is evaluating the artifacts. Evaluate the information gathered in the textual artifacts whether it is advantageous for the researchers to use or not. This is where the researchers can clearly see whether they understand the strength and weakness found in the textual artifacts. We can actually know whether the researchers clearly understand uh, the textual artifacts when they are stating their ideas and also their reasons in their research. In their research. So that is all for me. Thank you. Now, 
we move on to advantages and disadvantages of collecting textual artifacts. My name is Nura Anis Karida binti Zanabidin with metric number 047770. So we'll start with advantages first. So first of all, it is cost efficient. Using documents and records can be efficient and inexpensive because you are predominantly using research that has or that has already been completed. The second advantage of collecting textual artifacts is the coverage. So documents can provide background information and broad coverage of data and are therefore helpful in contextualizing one's research within its subject or field. They also cover a long span of time, many events and settings. So the third advantage of textual artifacts is that it is a stable and a reliable source of data. So by saying that documents are stable and a reliable source of data, it means that they can be read and reviewed for multiple times and still remain unchanged by the researcher's influence or the research process. The investigators presents or the researchers presents doesn't alter what is being studied. Documents then are suitable for repeated reviews. Next, it is a very efficient method. Document analysis is less time consuming and is therefore more efficient than other research methods. It is because it requires data selection instead of data collection as you can just refer to the past studies that has been completed. Besides that, obtaining and analyzing documents are often far more time efficient than conducting your own research or experiments. The fifth advantage of collecting textual artifacts is the availability of it. Many documents are in the public domain, especially since the advent of the internet, and are obtainable without the author's permission. This makes document analysis an attractive option, especially for qualitative researchers. So the last advantage of textual artifacts is the exactness or the accuracy of it. So the, inclu the inclusion of exact names, references and details of events makes documents advantageous in the research process. Okay, so now we move on to the disadvantages of textual artifacts. So, textual artifacts could sometimes be misleading or inaccurate. It is because the, since the researcher has less control over the results, uh, documents and records can be an incomplete data source. Next disadvantage, disadvantage is that it may not contain the data needed. So, textual artifacts may represent a different kind of data from the documents you find when doing a search of the existing literature or sometimes it may only provide a small amount of useful data or sometimes none at all. Okay, and sometimes there are gaps or sparseness of documents leading to more searching or reliance on additional documents than, than originally planned. So the third disadvantage of textual artifacts is the low retrievability of your documents. Documentation is sometimes not retrievable or the retrievability is difficult. For example, access to documents may be deliberately blocked and need the author's permission first for it to be readable or unlocked. Next is bias selectivity. An incomplete collection of documents sometimes suggests bias selectivity. In an organizational context, the available or the selected documents are likely to be aligned with corporate policies and procedures and with the agenda of the organization's principles. However, they may also reflect the emphasis of the particular organizational unit that handles, handles record keeping. For example, Human resources. So now moving on to the next part. Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. I'm Nora Aunibinti Narashid. Matrix number 047984. 
So I'm going to continue with the next part, which is ethics in collecting textual artifacts. So there are a few ethics in collecting the textual artifacts. Let's move on to the first ethic, which is be honest in reporting the data. So what does it mean by be honest in reporting the data? It means from the first procedure until the last procedure, you need to be honest. Be honest with yourself. So what should you do? You should report the data honestly. Honestly report the result, method, procedure, and also publication status. Do not fabricate, falsify, or misrepresent the data. So you need to remember, whatever you found while collecting textual artifact is what should be written in your research. Um, so for example, you found a fact um, while collecting the data. However, it might be different from your understanding. So in this case, you still need to follow what you have found and you should read more uh, and make sure you understand the facts instead of you interpret it based on your understanding. You cannot do this because um, your understanding might, if you interpret it based on your understanding, it might change the whole meaning of the facts that you have found. Let's move on to the second ethics, which is keep an open mind while collecting textual artifacts. So when you are collecting textual artifacts, you should keep an open mind in gathering the information and results. So what does it mean by this? It means even though the information might be different from what you believe, you still need to stick to the information that comes from a valid resources. So for example, you found a fax from the first website and it is written in a very short paragraph and easy to understand. And then you found another website saying the same thing, but it is written in a long paragraph and it is hard to understand. So you cannot just take it from the first website just because you don't want to read the second website because it is written in a long paragraph. No, that's not the way. You still need to analyze the second paragraph, I mean the second website, as long as the website is from a valid resources. Because you need to remember when you are analyzing um, textile artifacts, it comes from various resources. So you need to to be open, you need to just gather all information. You cannot choose which website you want to read uh, just because the website is written in a short paragraph. It cannot be lazy. You need to read everything uh, as long as it is from a valid resources. The next one is be careful in analyzing the textual artifacts. So you need to avoid careless errors and negligence. Carefully and critically examine the information. So as we all know, language is a symbol that conveys messages to the readers. Some words are used by the author to give a specific meaning to the reader. However, sometimes we as a reader might interpret the sender's original message differently. For example, when we are reading something, the author might use jargon words that not all of us understand, right? So we need to search for the meaning of the words that we didn't understand. We cannot simply just guess the meaning because that might change the whole context of what the author is trying to tell us. The next example is we use different ways of writing in social media. So we as the reader, we need to pay attention to how forms of written language are used in participants' social world. For example, Facebook, Twitter, and many more. Next, do not plagiarize. You cannot use unpublished data or result without permission. You need to give a proper acknowledgement or credit for all contribution in the research. 
Make sure you use the correct way in citing the sources and have the list of references at the end of the research, which means you cannot alter important information that you have gathered from the textual artifact. For example, all the names, the dates, the places that they have, they have mentioned in the textual artifact, you need to use them all. The last ethics is confidentiality. So you need to protect the confidential communication such as papers or grants submitted for publication, personal records, trade or military secret and passion records. So you need to ask the permission from the owner or as mentioned earlier, if you wanted to use it, then you need to properly follow the procedure. You cannot simply take it because when you use it for your research, it means everyone's going to read your research, right? So some textual artifact might be very confidential. So that is why you need to ask the permission first before you use it. Assalamu and good day I bid to everyone. My name is Amir Shafi bin Amman with the metric number 047916. Today, I will present to you guys the example of past study that uses the collection of textual artifacts. The title of the study is Constructing a Contextual History of English Language Technical Writing. This study was written by Stephen Crabb and it was published in 2012. Moving on to the abstract of this study. The aim of the study is historically contextualizes the emergence and development of English language technical writing from pre-industrial Britain onwards, looking in particular at how-to or instructional writing. Next is the methodology. The researchers use document analysis, or triangulation, in combination with other qualitative research methods to supplement data from other sources, such as participant or non-participant observation, and physical artifacts. Hey guys, it's me again, Muhammad Anwar bin Idha Nawawi. So in conclusion, we have discussed a lot of important things in collections of textual artifact, artifacts. I'm so sorry. So when analyzing texts and artifacts, the researchers may focus on how and for whom the artifacts is created and what is included and not included in the document and how the, the document is used. So this is to ensure that the infos are relevant to your research and to avoid bias in receiving the textual artifacts. So documents or textual artifacts should be analyzed in tandem, which means should be analyzed with other data collected so that your materials are sufficient and systematically organized. We have to remember that we should never use uh, the document resources as surrogates for other kinds of data. We cannot, for instance, look through, uh, learn through records alone how an organization actually works and operates day by day. Equally, we cannot treat records, however official, as a firm evidence of what they report, as stated by Atkinson and Coffee in 2017. For instance, if you want to do a research on how hospital administration operates, you cannot just depend on the written SOPs. You have to make thorough observation onto the whole organization so that your research will be more reliable. I think that's all from us. If you have any questions needed to be clarified, uh, don't hesitate to ask us by commenting in the comment section below. Thank you and have a great day, everyone. I miss you guys.